Since the end of the war in Vietnam, American armed forces had enjoyed a decade of relative peace until a strange set of circumstances brought elite units into armed conflict on the relatively unknown island of Grenada. This tiny dot on the map is strategically important because it guards the southernmost access to the Caribbean. Here, Cuban construction engineers were extending the runway at Point Salines to two miles, long enough to take any Soviet bloc military aircraft. This, coupled with other recent events on the island, impelled President Ronald Reagan to finally take action in October 1983. The island, independent since 1974, had been a cause for American concern since 1979, when a left-wing government under Morris Bishop seized power and began encouraging Russian and Cuban investment. When Bishop was himself deposed and executed by Army Chief General Hudson Austin, the United States responded to appeals from neighboring Caribbean islands to do something about the situation. There were also fears that American medical students on the island could be held hostage. A combined airborne and amphibious assault, codenamed Urgent Fury, was laid on, involving the U.S. 75th Ranger Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division, and 22nd Marine Amphibious Unit, flagship of the task force being the helicopter assault ship USS Guam. A primary task was the rescue of the Governor General, Sir Paul Schoon, from his residence outside the capital, St. George's. This was entrusted to a select Sea, Air, Land, or SEAL team, who preceded the main assault at dawn on Tuesday the 25th of October. As the U.S. Forces elite, SEAL teams are trained in all forms of amphibious and airborne infiltration techniques. Even as the SEALs set off on their mission, 400 Marines from the 22nd MAU began embarking in their choppers from the USS Guam to secure Pearls Airport near the eastern tip of the island. The Guam carries some 25 Sikorsky CH-46 Sea Knight and CH-53 Sea Stallion helicopters in the assault role. Throughout the early stages of the campaign, official military cameramen using handheld video equipment covered many of the important actions. As it turned out, the 50 caliber machine guns in the Sea Knights were hardly needed. The flight to target was uneventful, and the silver beaches welcoming. Although one helicopter was hit by light anti-aircraft fire and had to be abandoned, ground resistance was weak, and the remainder landed safely at 0536 hours. The Marines fanned out from their helicopters and took cover after eliminating the Soviet-supplied anti-aircraft guns. But they looked in vain for organized opposition from the Grenadian regulars guarding the airfield. The tougher Cuban troops on the island were concentrated at Point Salines. Once Pearl's airport was firmly in their hands, the Leathernecks sent patrols into the surrounding countryside closely supported from overhead by their Sea Knight helicopters, which would converge rapidly to lay down fire on any resistant stronghold. Now it was the turn of the Rangers to secure Point Salines airfield by means of a parachute drop from 500 feet, which is too low to allow the reserve chute to be deployed if the main one fails. The Rangers' 1st Battalion dropped successfully on target and accomplished their objective in record time, clearing the runway for the arrival of the 2nd Battalion. The initial airborne assault into here by the 1st and 2nd Ranger Battalion was about 7.15 in the morning, which was... Uh, uh, there was some live fire. The uh, aircraft themselves were receiving anti-aircraft gunfire. 
and uh, we jumped in at 500 feet. Second Ranger Battalion jumped in with no reserves, counting only on a T-10 to employ. And uh, we hit the airfield, moved up into the into the ground surrounding that area, and started sweeping over this area where the uh, enemy were firing back at us. Right? The assault had airborne firepower support in the form of AC-130E Spectre gunships of the 16th Special Operations Squadron, 23rd Air Force, which flew from friendly Barbados to take out Soviet armor as well as searchlights and flak installations on the island. Originally developed for Special Forces operations in Vietnam, the AC-130 is armed with 20mm M61 Vulcan six-barrel cannon. and carries sophisticated low-light television and infrared scanning equipment. Further backup was provided by U.S. Marine Corps Bell AH-1T Cobra attack helicopters equipped with tow anti-tank missiles and a chin-mounted 7.62mm minigun. At the time, these were the most up-to-date version of the famous Huey Cobra, which had given such brilliant service in Vietnam. They hovered constantly overhead as the Rangers began to advance inland from Point Salines, while the Cuban commander, Colonel Pedro Tortolo, fled to the sanctuary of the Soviet embassy in St. George's. The Rangers' next objective was to clear the bluff overlooking the airfield, from which heavy sniper fire continued to pour. It was an anxious time for the Cuban and Grenadian forces were pushed back from the perimeter of Point Salines airport, still resisting fiercely in places, Transport aircraft began arriving with reinforcements and heavy equipment. Both C-141 Starlifter and C-130 Hercules transports were used in this phase, some of them flown by Air National Guard crews. These aircraft were to bring in over 5,000 men of the 82nd Airborne with all their supplies and equipment. The 82nd's jeeps, armed with machine guns, would provide heavy fire support. After repelling two Cuban counterattacks, the Rangers reached True Blue Campus to the relieved cheers and laughter of the 130 medical students there. The operation took a mere 26 minutes and was over by 0850. The following afternoon, the remaining students at Grand Ancy campus had also been rescued by men of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. Glad, glad to see you all, as I hope you are to see us. General, you all have one hell of a lot of thanks to these guys who went in and got you out. Right. Why don't you 
address him. I think they'd love yeah, him. Yeah, if I can have your attention just a minute, please. Yeah. 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 Settle down. We, uh, we got the mission to go in and pick you up, and we're trying to figure out the best way to do it. And we had someone uh, down at the other school talking on a landline to make absolutely sure that we got you out without getting in anyone injured. We were going to go in at 1600, at 1500, and we had to put it off because we had to shoot a preparation over in the Cuban area. That uh, who's the guy who talked to us on the telephone? Okay, great. Oh, him that way. No, I mean the guy down down there. Okay, so what we did, the uh, they flew the helicopters in off an aircraft carrier, and in a very very short order, we put the operation together, coordinated the fire support, and thank goodness uh, we were able to put uh, 130 Rangers out of the Second Ranger Battalion in Fort Lewis, Washington, on the beach for you. Woo! But we couldn't have got there without the aviators, which uh, took ground air fire in their aircraft, and we had to abandon one CH-46 on the thing. So we deserve those guys a grip. Uh, grip. Yeah. Thank you very much. After a brief address by Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Hagler, the medics were evacuated by helicopter. Canadian Embassy, United States Embassy. We're here to make sure you guys get home tonight. While all this was happening, the SEALs, who had been sent in to rescue the Governor General, had been involved in a fierce firefight and suffered heavy casualties. Two helicopter gunships which had attempted to support them had been shot down, but Marine reinforcements flown in by CH-53C stallions began to arrive. Marine officers quickly issued orders for the new arrivals to deploy. Caution still had to be exercised because of the danger of lone snipers. Despite the dangers, the sea stallions continued to shuttle between the ships and shore, bringing in ammunition and evacuating the wounded. With the first phase of the operation successfully over, and the 82nd Airborne now at Point Salines to relieve the Rangers, the USS Guam moved around the coast to land fresh troops at Grand Mal Bay. At first light on Wednesday morning, the Marines at Pearls Airport were also flown by helicopter to take part in removing the remaining pockets of resistance in and around St. George's. Top cover was provided by Vought A7 Crusader IIs, Grumman A6 Intruders, and even F-14 Tomcats from the USS Independence.
On the ground, the Rangers, Marines, and airborne forces advance carefully, leaving few stones unturned. This policy minimized civilian casualties and resulted in only 18 Americans dead with when the machine guns appeared. Watching a small piece of history being made had an obvious fascination for many people. Peering from balconies or windows or around the corners of doors, the Grenadian locals watched the Americans with huge interest. In many places, the welcome was rapturous, and plenty of people were surprised at the number of black faces among the troopers. Cuban propaganda had not led them to expect white Americans taking orders from black officers. Even members of the People's Revolutionary Army seemed jaunty after capture. while the children thought it was all a wonderful adventure, of course. To support the troops, the USS Guam had offloaded 13 LVTP-7 amphibious assault vehicles, as well as five M60 tanks. Jeeps, some armed with tow anti-tank weapons, also played a significant part in reducing the opposition as well as doubling as prisoner transport. A wide variety of Eastern Bloc and Cuban arms was captured, including this 82 millimeter B-10 recoilless gun. Despite its antiquated appearance, it is light and can be easily moved around and served by two or three men. The ZU-23 twin-barreled anti-aircraft gun is a favored weapon throughout the Warsaw Pact and, if competently manned, is lethal against low-flying aircraft. Even more efficient was a quadruple-barreled heavy machine gun which was towed away for shipment back to the USA. Large stocks of ammunition and small arms were also captured. These included the efficient AK-47 assault rifle. Cobras remained alert, even while the ground forces were eliminating the last pockets of resistance. Then the International Press Corps arrived in strength to see for themselves what was happening, while an M60 tank stood guard on the skyline. The CO of the 22nd Marine Amphibious Unit, Lieutenant Colonel Ray Smith, made his point forcefully in an unofficial briefing. Before, I, before you ask me a question, I'd like, to, I'd like to give you a couple of suggestions. Now, you can do what you want to do. The, people around here though are the story in my view the last uh however many days it's been since uh tuesday morning within 20 minutes after we landed i personally landed within, within 20 minutes after i personally landed and i uh, furled airfield up north on the north, north side of the air island i had many of these people coming up telling me how glad they were we finally came. Now that's not what I've heard uh, around elsewhere, but I'm telling you, everywhere we've gone, I've, I've got people telling me, God, I'm glad to see you finally attempt. I've been waiting for four years for this, and I'll guarantee you, I, I please ask you, go out there and ask them they're standing around there now. And I, if, you don't, if you find one that don't say that, 
I'll be surprised. Basically, let me give you an example of why they, why they were glad. I asked people up at Pearls when I first got here, uh, we, within uh, two hours after we landed, I asked a couple of the civilians that came up to talk to me, how were we going to tell the communists and the People's Revolutionary Army soldiers from the militiamen and the civilians? And they told me, look for the brand new big cars. Now, that's their statement. Look for the brand new big cars. Those are the communists. Those people who might have tried to say that American intervention in Grenada was an example of U.S. imperialism were deflated by the fact that a contingent of 400 troops was supplied by the Organization of East Caribbean States. This included men from Barbados, Jamaica, Dominica, St. Kitts, Antigua, and St. Vincent, who would remain as a peacekeeping force when the Americans withdrew. The last strong point to be reduced on the third day of the invasion was the Cuban barracks at Edgemont, where some 400 communists were thought to be holed up. First, men of the 82nd Airborne surrounded the compound. Then, the Rangers 2nd Battalion flew into the attack in UH-60 Blackhawks. Unfortunately, three helicopters crashed, causing three fatalities and 15 injured, while the barracks were actually found to be virtually deserted. It had been a different story at Calvini Barracks the previous day, when two Blackhawks crashed under heavy fire, the pilot of one and a ranger being killed. But the rangers had knocked out the opposition and had reason to be proud. Then it was time to relax, time to take off combat kit and prepare for the flight home. Within a few days, all American troops had left the island, apart from some engineers who remained to complete the rebuilding of Point Celine's airfield. The operation had proved America's rapid deployment capability and restored democracy to the Southern Caribbean. I'm Lieutenant Bowen from Charlie Company, 1st Ranger Battalion, 75th Infantry, out of Fort Stewart, Correction, Hunter Army Airfield. I'm a Ranger This is Charlie Company. men who uh, did all the work and uh, real proud of them. They did a real fine job, ready to go home now. And uh, uh, our company had no casualties, uh, no one got hurt even. And uh, we're real happy to be going home. In fact, uh, right there, we hope to be boarding very quickly. The task force commander, Rear Admiral Joseph Metcalf, had the final word. Shaking hands with a real pro. Oh, Good to have you here. Yeah. Welcome back. Thank you, 
tight may not know, but I'm in the knee. I'm supposed to be running this whole thing. Uh, but I'll tell you who's really running it, who's really making it go, are you people right here. And last night you weren't watching television. But anyway, the president went on television, you know, and he recognized the contribution that you're making. He recognized you guys down here in Granada. In 1983, American military involvement was also stepped up on the other side of the world, in the Middle East, where Iran and Iraq had been at war since September 1980. In August 1983, this conflict took a new turn when Iraq declared a naval exclusion zone. The states surrounding the Persian Gulf supply over a third of the world's crude oil, and any disruption in the steady flow could have a crippling effect on Western economies. Both Iran and Iraq were determined to keep their own oil flowing to pay for the war. Iraq had the advantage of an overland pipeline into Turkey, but Iran's exports almost all went by sea, funneled through the narrow Straits of Hormuz. The United States had already said it would do whatever was necessary to keep the Straits open to international traffic. A mixed task force of American, British, French and Australian naval vessels had helped provide escort for neutral tankers since the beginning of the war. Despite this, there had already been a few casualties and shipping losses. The tankers generally traveled in convoy for mutual protection, hugging the coastline either side of the Gulf to gain protection from shore-based anti-aircraft batteries. Helicopters were used extensively as decoys against hostile missiles, using their speed and maneuverability to escape being hit at the last moment. They were not always successful, though, as the tanker Bridgeton discovered in 1987 when an Iraqi exocet found its mark. Extra protection was provided mainly by U.S. warships, operating in rotation from both the Atlantic and the Pacific. To begin with, each unit stayed on station for four months, but this was reduced to two as the shooting war got hotter. After France supplied Iraq with long-range Super Etandar naval strike aircraft and Exocet missiles, Iran responded by threatening to close the Straits of Hormuz. In 1986, they installed Chinese silkworm anti-ship missiles around Bandar Abbas Air Base. On board U.S. warships in the Gulf, crews were almost permanently at action stations. One of the principal weapons deployed was the Stinger man-portable anti-aircraft missile. This lightweight system fires a missile at over twice the speed of sound to a range of some three miles, guidance being by passive infrared sensor. It's a very accurate weapon, which incorporates an identification friend or foe mechanism to prevent friendly aircraft being shot down by mistake. Stinger is only one of the anti-aircraft systems used on modern American warships. The most sophisticated is the Aegis radar tracking system, fitted to Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruisers. This can track multiple targets simultaneously and fire standard SM-2 medium-range missiles from banks of launches. The SM-2 is a supersonic missile with semi-active homing and a range of over 15 miles. It was, unfortunately, one such missile fired from the USS Vincennes, which accidentally shot down an Iranian A-300 Airbus in July 1988, killing all 286 people on board. The ship's captain said they had the aircraft identified as an F-14 Tomcat, but no one has satisfactorily explained why, because an F-14 is only a third the size of an Airbus. 
As a purely defensive measure, U.S. warships can also dispense chaff to confuse the radar guidance on some forms of missile. A number of merchant ships were fitted with similar systems as the war dragged on. One of the most potent weapons deployed in the Gulf War was the French Exocet, fired from Iraqi Mirages, Super Etandars, and Freylon helicopters. The AM-39 is a radar-guided solid-fueled missile which drops rapidly to wavetop height after launch to help prevent detection. Flying just below the speed of sound, it has a range of over 40 miles and a 364-pound warhead, which had already proved its destructiveness in the Falklands War. In May 1987, the 3,700-ton frigate USS Stark became the first American warship to be hit by an Exocet. Modern warships only have light armor, relying on their anti-missile defenses to prevent a hit in the first place. In this case, the ship's phalanx close-in weapon system was unable to cope. As a result, the Iraqi Exocet blew an enormous hole in the hull and superstructure just below the bridge, killing 37 men. However, the Stark was not holed below the waterline and managed to limp to safety, escorted by other warships. Clearing up the damage and preparing the bodies for burial was still a heartbreaking task for men who thought they were helping to keep world peace. Ironically, although 274 ships of different nationalities were attacked by Iraqi Exocets and Iranian Maverick missiles during 1987 alone, with 64 deaths, the lumbering tankers suffered the least. As well as missiles, Mines were also a constant danger. During 1987, Iran intensified its mine-laying activities. In September that year, the U.S. Middle East Force flagship La Salle intercepted an Iranian landing craft, the Iran Aja, converted to the mine-laying role. On board were dozens of Mark M08 percussion-fused mines packed with 250 pounds of explosive preset to lie about 40 feet beneath the surface, where they would do the most damage to a tanker. The mines were not fused, but were otherwise fully warmed up, ready to be laid. The Iranians seemed careless of whose ships suffered. Part of the reason for this was that both Kuwait and Saudi Arabia sided tacitly with Iraq in the conflict and their vessels became prime targets for the Iranians. The tankers generally survived attacks from either mines or missiles, though, because of their sheer bulk and carefully compartmented construction. But not all were lucky. The commander of La Salle provided his own commentary. Uh, the waters west of Farsi Island, where the Bridgeton was hit, are international waters. I think you're, uh, you're not... You're, the principle is the same. Uh, international water is international water, and that's where they're laying mines, and it's wrong. But essentially, it was right under the noses of U.S. forces. Perhaps they were. Uh, perhaps they were a bit bolder than they should have been. But again, uh, the the key here is not to be complacent, uh, to use your forces as well as you can, but. Uh, It certainly indicates that the Gulf is uh, still not a safe place to sail, but we're here to do a job. U.S. naval forces also became well used to keeping prisoners from sunken Iranian and Iraqi ships under close guard. They were held, individually handcuffed and lying on stretchers, in secure places such as helicopter hangars aboard La Salle. Although the United States was not at war with either combatant, Despite having crossed swords with both over recent years in the Lebanon and during the Tehran embassy hostage crisis, official U.S. policy throughout the Gulf War was that of an umpire. 
It was, however, a policy called into question during the so-called Irangate scandal, when it was revealed that the Reagan administration had been secretly dealing with both sides. Most captives came from small gunboats, for as the untidy war of attrition dragged towards an end, the Iranians resorted to the use of tiny coastal craft fitted with RPG-7 anti-tank missile launchers and 23mm anti-aircraft guns. One such boat was discovered drifting abandoned by the crew of the USS Stark sister ship, Reuben James. This was the fourth such craft captured by the American Middle East force in a single six-month period. Western navies were not alone in patrolling the Gulf to help prevent the conflict spreading. The Soviet Navy also maintained a presence of about 25 surface ships and submarines throughout the conflict, including Krivat-class patrol vessels. Slightly smaller than the Reuben James and Stark, these are armed with anti-submarine as well as anti-aircraft missiles and 100 millimeter guns. Despite the fact that both superpowers were anxious to avoid a confrontation in the Gulf, which could have led to global escalation, helicopters kept an alert watch and gun crews were closed up during such encounters. Iranian SRN-7 hovercraft were another common sight. The British Royal Navy maintained a force of around 12 ships in the Gulf battle group until the final ceasefire between Iran and Iraq in August 1988. Working closely with US warships, one of the greatest contributions made by the Royal Navy was in mine sweeping. Frigates and destroyers regularly streamed paravanes on steel wires to cut through the mooring lines of submerged mines and bring them to the surface where they could be destroyed by machine gun fire. The minesweepers normally operated in threes to clear a channel wide enough for a supertanker. Each vessel in the flotilla following directly behind the paravane trailed by the ship in front to give complete overlap. At the end of each run, the paravanes would be hauled inboard to be checked over prior to the next operation. To counter the threat posed by free-floating acoustic or magnetic mines, which cannot be swept by conventional means, the Royal Navy also deployed remote-controlled submersibles. Originally designed for the underwater inspection of offshore oil rigs, these have now become standard mine-hunting equipment. Wire guided, they are fitted with searchlights and television cameras as well as active sonar and patrol directly ahead of the mine hunting warship. On searchlight. Searchlight, sir. There's the MDC. Roger, there's the MDC. Okay. Come left, uh, 350. Reduce speed. Value A, two yards. Value B. Two and a half yards. Yard of shadow, plus one main. 
After detection, the mines could be destroyed by rapid fire from the 20 mm Ehrlichan cannon now fitted to most Royal Navy warships. One of the most modern British vessels on the scene was the Type 42 destroyer HMS York, which was only commissioned in 1985. These missile armed ships are specifically designed for area air defense. While the US Navy continues to maintain a presence in the Gulf, the British warships have now been recalled to other duties. In April 1988, the United States Navy took drastic action in retaliation for the Iranian mine laying. Since the Karg Island oil terminal had come under repeated Iraqi attack since early in the war, Iran had switched much of its production to the offshore rigs at Sasan and Siri. On the 18th of April, the frigate USS Samuel B. Roberts issued a warning to the crews of both platforms that they were going to be destroyed. After the Iranians evacuated the platforms, sailors from the Roberts boarded them and discovered large numbers of anti-aircraft guns and missiles. The platforms were then destroyed by gunfire, while aircraft from the carrier Enterprise prevented any interference. Empty shell cases could be seen bobbing in the water. The Iranian boats tried foolishly to attack the Roberts and were blown out of the water. President Reagan said, if they threaten us, they'll pay a price. The Iranians retaliated to the loss of the rigs by sending patrol ships into the Strait of Hormuz in a frontal attack on warships of the Middle East force. Once their intentions were clear, American frigates engaged them with their 76 mm bow guns and sunk them. An Iranian fighter aircraft was also shot down by a standard missile. This unique footage shows the bridge aboard the USS Vincennes while under attack by a number of Iranian gunboats. It is typical of operations during the Gulf War. During this action, she fired on and destroyed an Iranian Airbus airliner. Iranian Revolutionary Guard patrol boats maneuvering at speed Contact. 
By July 1988, with the Iraqi army in Basra and a new offensive gaining momentum, it was obvious that Iran could no longer continue the war. Ceasefire talks encouraged by the United Nations commenced on the 8th of August, after the Iraqis voluntarily withdrew from the captured territory, and peace negotiations began in Geneva on the 25th of the same month. The eight-year conflict was finally over. The North African state of Libya is another world trouble spot of grave concern to the United States. Here, the formerly friendly monarchy was overthrown in 1969 by the Islamic fundamentalist leader and political anarchist Muammar Gaddafi. Under Gaddafi, Libya has become a haven for terrorist organizations from all over the world. The U.S. Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean has been keeping close watch off the Libyan coastline for many years. There have been several clashes between Libyan and American aircraft, notably over the Gulf of Sidra in 1981, when aircraft from the USS Coral Sea splashed two Libyan fighters. The principal Libyan combat aircraft are the MiG-23 Flogger, MiG-25 Foxbat, and Su-22 Fitter, plus some French Mirage F-1s and 5s. Then in January 1986, Gaddafi drew a line of death across the Gulf of Sidra, openly challenging the United States to take action in support of international maritime law. From the end of January 1986, A-6 intruders, A-7 Corsairs, F-14 Tomcats and F-18 Hornets began flying almost constant combat air patrols from the carriers Coral Sea and Saratoga. The fighters carried a full load of Sparrow and Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles at all times and carried out several interceptions of Libyan aircraft which ventured towards the carrier groups. In every case during this phase of operations though, the Libyans made no hostile moves and meekly allowed themselves to be turned back inland. In March, reinforced by the USS America battle group, U.S. ships crossed Gaddafi's line of death for the first time. The Libyans responded by sending out Nanuchka-class missile corvettes, one of which was sunk by a harpoon missile launched from an A-6, and another damaged. In this slow-motion infrared sequence, a missile can be seen leaving the aircraft and hitting one of the Libyan vessels. Now, in response to a new wave of terrorist attacks in Europe, planning began for a major operation to teach the Libyan leader a lesson. On the 14th of April, President Reagan gave the okay for direct action against military barracks, airfields and terrorist training camps at Tripoli and Benghazi. The U.S. 6th Fleet would be reinforced by Air Force F-111 strike aircraft flying from bases in the United Kingdom. At RAF Lakenheath, 24 F-111Fs of the 48th Tactical Fighter Wing rolled out of their shelters and began to take off at 1800 hours. They were supported by four EF-111 Raven Electronic Countermeasures aircraft from the 42nd Electronic Combat Squadron at Upper Hayford. Because both France and Spain refused to allow the aircraft to overfly their airspace, 
the flight path had to be routed over the sea. Meanwhile, the carrier groups also maneuvered into position for their own attacks. The F-111s used in the strike were all armed with the PAVTAC weapon system. This is a streamlined pod which rotates out from the aircraft's belly when in use. It contains sophisticated terrain-following radar, as well as infrared and laser target designators, which guide modern smart bombs accurately onto target. The bombs dropped on this mission were 2,000-pound Mark 84 Paveway laser-guided weapons and 500-pound Mark 82 snake eyes. In-flight refueling was accomplished in four stages on the outward journey and two on the return by KC-10 and KC-135 tankers from Fairford, Mildenhall and NATO bases in Italy. Official Air Force targets in and around Tripoli were the Libyan Frogman HQ at Sidi Bilal, Gaddafi's command post headquarters in the Azizia barracks, and military transports at Tripoli Airport. The Navy was tasked with striking an alternative command post at the Jamahiria barracks in Benghazi, and the air defense base at Benina. As the F-111s approached their targets, the paved tack pods were swung out in the terrain following mode, and the laser designators switched on to warm up. These sample infrared line scan images show first the approach to the coast. Next is the low-level bombing run on the Azizia barracks. Gaddafi's circular white tent and even the tent poles are clearly visible. Members of his family were reportedly killed and wounded here. Finally, the F-111s approach Tripoli Military Airport. Here, five Aleutian 76 transports on the ground are severely damaged by Snake Eye retarded bombs. In the Libyan capital, the attack erupted. Libya possessed SA-3 and SA-5 surface-to-air missiles and certainly fired many of her 23, 30 and 57 mm anti-aircraft guns. Since the attack on Tripoli lasted only 11 minutes, and the defenses were not on alert. Most of the fire loosed off by the defenders was certainly much too late. The gunners and rocket men actually firing wild. Despite the use of precision bombing methods, some weapons landed off target in a number of city areas. There were civilian casualties, perhaps as many as 300. Hospital wards began to fill up. The exasperated Libyan militias vented their anger. In the Tripoli suburb of Bin Ashur, close to the Libyan National Security Building, the French embassy was hit. The Swiss and Iranian embassies were also slightly damaged. It is probable that damage was also caused by Libyan SAMs, which had missed their targets, falling back to Earth. For the attack on Benghazi, the Navy's carriers Carl C. and America launched 24 A-6 intruders. Six F.A. 18 Hornets were also dedicated to the attack. Main strike was provided by the intruders, mostly armed with 750-pound bombs.
harm anti-radiation missiles which home on the radar emissions of enemy detection and gun and missile guidance radars were also employed. And these certainly accounted for a complete missile battery south of Benghazi. The strike against Benina probably prevented the Libyans from scrambling their potent Mirage F-1 and MiG-25 Foxbat interceptors before the U.S. aircraft had departed Libyan airspace. In all, both raids actually lasted only 13 minutes. Shortly afterwards, one F-111 was reported downed and a search and rescue mission was launched from the carriers. Unfortunately, the two-man crew were lost. Major Fernando Ribas Dominici and Captain Paul Lawrence were subsequently awarded posthumous air medals. The remainder of the strike force returned safely to their bases, although one F-111 had to divert to Rota in Spain because of an overheating problem. The first F-111 touched down back at Lakenheath at 06.30 hours the following morning. Mission accomplished. Later reconnaissance by high-flying SR-71 Blackbirds from Mildenhall confirmed the accuracy of the strike, performed at night after a grueling six-hour flight. The next direct clash between America and Libya took place on the 4th of January, 1989. Tension was high because of disclosures that Libya was building a chemical weapons plant at Rabta. Two F-14 Tomcats had taken off from the USS John F. Kennedy on a routine patrol when at 11.55 hours an E-2C Hawkeye warned them that two Libyan MiG-23 floggers had just taken off. As the Libyans drew closer, the F-14 weapons officers locked on their missile guidance radars. The MiGs ignored this warning and continued to close in an attack mode. The leading Tomcat fired two Sparrow air-to-air -air missiles, which missed. The Libyans turned towards the wingman, who fired a Sparrow which hit one MiG, then followed through with a Sidewinder, which splashed the other. Okay, he's got a missile off. Breaking right. Okay. Good hit, good hit on one. Roger that. Good kill, good kill. I've got the other one. Select Fox 2, select Fox 2. I got Fox 2. Out of the trailer. Shoot him. I don't got a tone. Got the second one. I got the second one on the nose right now. Hey, I'm high cover on you. Get a Fox, get a lock him up. Lock him up. Man, shoot him, Fox 2. I can't, I don't have a tone. So, so what? <laughs> Good kill, good kill. The two MiG pilots ejected safely, and the Tomcats turned back towards the carrier. Okay, my sir, let's head north, head north. Okay, port side, high, I'm coming down hard. The U.S. armed forces had demonstrated once again that America will not give in to international terrorism. <laughs>